Sorry. Um, this is my first time speaking to a macro crowd, so please bear with me as well. Uh, so I'm here to talk about breast reconstruction and um, kind of after surgery advice from kind of the nursing aspect. I'm um, a nurse in St. James Hospital. I worked in London beforehand. So I haven't really worked in the other Dublin-based hospitals. So uh, the information that I'll give you will be broad, but kind of James is specific and each team does things in a different way. Not one way is right, it's just how the services work. So if what I say is different to what goes on for you, it doesn't mean it's a bad thing or a good thing. It's just we all kind of do things a little differently. And the main thing is also, like you've seen today, all the different reconstructions are very different. So the post-op care is a little bit different as well. So I'm going to speak in a broad term um, about them. So I'm sure you've been through this already, but when you do actually come to decide on a reconstruction, it's very much a shared decision between you and the teams. You've obviously got your plastic surgeon's input, and um, you've got your breast team input as well, especially if you're having reconstruction for breast cancer, you know, timings of surgery, the treatments you need sometimes can impact on the reconstruction and have a way you have it. And then also your wishes, what you want and what you want to do are really important. Um, especially when you have a choice on the different types or when you do things, what you want is a very big part of um, what, you know, your decision-making process. So obviously there's lots of different types of reconstructions. I'm not going to bore you with them. You've seen them all today already. So there's implants, you know, and then there's using your own tissue. So it likes using the DX flap. The LD is the one from the back. Um, and then the tub flap is also from um, using uh, tissue from your thighs. And um, when you have come to a decision about reconstruction, you've got a date for surgery. You need a bit of pre op education and well. A lot of hospitals have anesthetic team reviews. So you get a pre assessment to make sure you're actually suitable to have a surgery. So, not even just picking an operation, it's very much based on can you have an anesthetic as well, is also very important. Things that you can help with that is prehabilitation. So Kelly's okay, physio is going to be up next, but exercise is super important for all of us. I know we all know it, but especially if you're going for chemotherapy before surgery, you know, doing exercise through your treatment will actually give you better outcomes afterwards. And um, smoking is obviously a big no-no. It's an even bigger no-no if you're having reconstruction. And um, I'm not going to tell you to stop, but everybody else will. Expect the nurses that you meet on the day. Um, and your general health is important. Your diet is really important, especially after surgery. Protein is really good for wound healing. Um, and, you know, you need your calories to heal. So I will always, um, for the doctors, but I will always say have that slice of cake because you do need the calories. But just, you know, one slice of cake, not the whole thing, is really important. <laughs> I don't listen to my advice all the time, but anyway, you will also get a bit of information about actually how you come into the hospital. So who are you calling? What ward are you going to? What time you need to be in at? And fasting as well are really important, but that's very hospital specific and can be very, very day specific as well. So you've given all that information. What to bring to hospital is really important. And um, depending on the reconstruction, you're going to have your pajamas or your nightdress is a very important choice. Something that opens at the front, everybody's going to want to be looking at what's going on. So if you have something that goes over your head, you're just going to be pulling it up all the time. So something that you can open at the front, or if it's a nightdress, then it's a wide-fitting nightdress with some buttons on the front. If you're going for a DF reconstruction, that's tummy surgery. You don't want to be sticking trousers. It's going to line on that line. So a nightdress is probably easier. Um, but it's, it's kind of just making sure that you know that bit. Phone charger is super important. Headphones earplugs, the little things that you kind of forget about, leave the jewelry at home and always goes walking, no matter what fancy hospital you're in. And there's a safe on every ward, but they're super small. You know, you try and bring in as little as possible. Money for the shop. If you want to have a glass of seven up or a Coke or a chocolate bar, those things don't come up on the ward. If you want to have an extra cup of tea or a cotton, you need money for it. And um, length of stay, dependent on your on what surgery you're having, will also depend on how many knickers you bring into the hospital and how many pairs of pajamas you bring in as well. Really important for that as well. And then what to expect in hospital, and that will be very specific to each different operation. Normally, if you have enough knickers and you have a phone charger, you'll get through to the next day before somebody brings you in something else for you. And um, we go through a bit about pain management as well. Obviously, it's an operation. You're going to have a cut. It's going to be sore. We'll talk you through that and what to expect afterwards. Um, and then we go through a bit about potential complications. You know, every operation has a side effect. Every side effect may or may not happen to somebody. 
So we'll kind of give you a heads up about what you're going to expect. But, you know, we always have to tell you the worst. I'm sure some of the doctors have been through it, especially when you're signing your consent. They tell you the worst of everything, but not everybody experiences the worst of everything. But you need to know it so that you're not shocked if it does happen to you. They write wound advice and dressings, or what we call plasters. Sorry, um, I popped that down there, but we'll tell you a little bit about that. What you're meant to do with them, if you're to touch them, if you're not to touch them. That's very doctor specific as well. Everybody has what they like, so um, it'll be very specific to you. And then drains, you will have drains after surgery. I'll go through a little bit about that. Body image will touch on before surgery, but we also touch on it afterwards. I don't need to tell you that it's a massive, massive indicator for what, you know, we don't call it a side effect because it's part of the journey, but it is a big, big point about it. And I will go into that in a little bit of time as well. And then the recovery time is very different for every surgery, very different for every woman. You know, the lady decides you could have the exact same surgery and it could take you a month more than her. And that's not a bad thing. It's just his body heals and it's so then you come in, you have your operation, it all goes fantastically. And um, you feel a lot less anxious after you've had the surgery. You know, no matter how prepared you can be, it's always really nerve wracking walking down your gown into the operation room and then being put to sleep and some, you know, counting to 10 backwards and waking back up and you see a different face in front of you. After that, you will feel a lot more relaxed. It's done. So afterwards, You'll have a nurse bothering you constantly for first 15 minutes and then for an hour afterwards, making sure your vital signs are okay. If you have had breast cancer surgery, they'll make sure that they're not doing the blood pressure on the side yeah. that you've had surgery. And you might find that you wake up with oxygen on as well. So we'll be checking all those levels. We're checking the wounds. You'll have wound dressings on sometimes they're um, waterproof. If you've got drains in, you cannot shower with the drains. You might be able to have a half shower. So the nurses will go through that with you. And then pain relief. Depending on the operation, you might just be given oral tablets or you might be given a pain uh, drip that goes through your arm as well. Or sometimes they use spinal blocks. So everybody's a little bit different. If you have pain, ask for painkillers. That is my number one rule. I am a baby for pain. I will take it if I even think a headache is happening for me. So, you know, you've had a surgery. Don't be a martyr. If you feel pain, tell somebody. They will give you extra painkillers. They base the painkillers you go home on on how much painkillers you've had in the hospital. So if you've been sitting there as a marcher, they're going to grind. Oh, she needs paracetamol on your foot. Boom. You get home and you have to walk upstairs, the bathroom might be upstairs, and then you have to go downstairs because you forgot something. And if you're at home in your pain, you can't get your out. So, you know, ask. They'll tell you when you've had too many. You know, there's never going to be, you've had them taken too much. They will let you know. But it's really important to know about painkillers. And to take painkillers, even if you're not in pain, they will give you regular painkillers to take. It keeps your pain threshold at a higher level. It's easier to get out of the pain if you've got painkillers already on board. So everybody thinks paracetamol is like Smarties. It's actually brilliant. If you take paracetamol regularly, it really works really well and helps an extra painkiller work even better on top of that. Physio, super important. Kelly here is going to go through all of it, but exercise is the thing. You know, sitting upright opens your lungs big, um, wide. Wide is not the right term. Open your lungs more. So, you know, it, it reduces your risk of getting chest infections. So we don't want you, you know, stuck to the bed. We want you open about. You know, even if it is just walking up and, up and down the stairs or just a five minute walk to shop or not to shop, but, you know, down the garden or something, even a little bit is better than nothing. And then you will have restrictions. There are driving restrictions and lifting restrictions. They're very important because they vary during the operations um, depending on how long and can be out for driving. And if you live down the countryside, you know, taking away your ability to drive does really restrict you. And people do get a bit of cabin fever. So it's important to know exactly when you can and can't drive again. Specific breast uh, surgery and um, operative care will be the, re so the reconstruction specific requirements. If you have a flat based reconstruction, you will have flat monitoring. So they're normally about every 15 minutes for the first few hours, then they can go to 20 or so. Each doctor uses a different kind of pathway, depends on how they're going. So that's really important with the gowns as well. If somebody's going to be constantly looking at your breast the whole time, you don't want to be taking it up and off your top. Uh, it also means you don't get very much sleep the first night either, but um, you'll get through that. If um, sometimes you have a heated room as well, depending on the operation, they want to keep your veins dilated so that the, the uh, blood and oxygen circulate through the body a little bit better and through the, the vascular 
it's baths that they do. So the room does get very hot. If you know you're having that surgery, bring a little handheld fan with you as well as a lifesaver. Um, and if you're having flat base reconstruction, you might have your catheters in as well. And so what that does is it helps go to the toilet without actually having to get up. Um, they feel very uncomfortable, feels really weird, but they're a little lifesaver for the first day as well. And that's another reason to wear um, a nightdress because you can't have that hanging over the top of your bottles. Positioning in bed is really important. You probably have a few pillows underneath your legs, maybe a few pillows underneath your arms. You'll start to know the positions that help you and what help you get into less pain as well. Especially when you go home, making sure you have a rake of pillows. They don't need to be fancy ones to take steel them from somebody else's bed. They're going to pop under the feet to make sure that you um, keep that tummy toward, uh, not too tense. Support bras are one of the best things. They actually help reduce your pain as well. They keep the breasts in place. They help take the tension off the breasts and the scar lines. And they, they're really, really good. You want to wear your bra at night and day for approximately three to six weeks, depending on the reconstruction. Uh, what we're looking for is a non-wired bra and thick straps so that it distributes the weight of the, bra, um, the breast over your back. Slip up the front ones are helpful, but you need to know, like, some of the reconstructions, you'll wake up with the bra from the hospital. Some people will ask you to bring one in. Try it on before you buy it. And um, there are some fancy ones, and like if you're looking at sports bras, they're always tighter than they are like than your normal size anyway. After surgery, you're going to be a bit swollen. So what fits you now is not going to fit you after. Is make sure you can fit two fingers underneath the bra strap com comfortably. And if it is a front opening zip, there is no given that. At least with the ones at the back, you've got three hooks, and you can add on the extender. So. If you're buying jeans, don't take the, strat the the tags off, keep the receipts, but also don't buy something that fits you now, buy maybe the next band size up. Um, draining care, I'm gonna go through, and then the psychological support. The nurses are there on the board, the breast care nurses, the plastics nurses, whatever's in your hospital, you can use them, okay? And drain care, I do have, anyway, there's different types of drains we use, different doctors do different drains, not one is better than, well, I don't think one is better than the other, but um, you'll be taught how to use it, okay? A lot of patients will go home with drains. Staying with drains may delay your, go, your discharge date, depending on how confident you feel with them. And um, you'll be taught how to empty drains if you need to milk the drains and how to monitor the output and monitor the side for infection. If you're having bilateral surgery, you could have a drain either side. You might have two either side. If you're having GF reconstruction, you'll have drains in the tummy as well. Um, so the amount of drains you go home with is very dependent on each person and their teeth as well. And if you have young kids at home and you're going home with three drains, and you know they're just maybe you should stay until you can manage two. Um, and the team will go through that with you. And normally drains are taken out after the volumes reach a certain level. And in our hospital, we do that in the patients department. It might be different to my go to the service that in your hospital. Complications. So there's complications of everything in life. Um, anesthetic complications, nausea, vomiting. I don't know if anybody's had an anesthetic before, but it can make you feel very sick afterwards. The hematomas, like an internal bruise that you can get, which can make the uh, reconstruction feel very hard um, and very tight. Sometimes you might need to go back for surgery if it's a big one. Wound infections, really important to keep an eye on them. The risks of them happening are quite low, but like that, if you, if you smoke, if you have a high BMI or if you have any other issues like diabetes and things like that, it increases your risk. So it's just be important to be aware what you're looking out for. And um, especially if you're having an implant-based reconstruction, if the in infection gets in and around the implant, sometimes surgery is the only option to get rid of that. And um, so we'd often start patients on antibiotics. Sometimes we bring patients in to have inpatient IV antibiotics, so antibiotic drips, and then go from there. Flat face reconstructions have their own issues as well. Um, and that will be gone through with you in a lot more detail when you're having the surgery. But they can be big, you know, if you have a big um, a big uh, issue with the flap, and then the only option is actually to get rid of the, the dead tissue, that's a big, you know, a very big psychological effect. You'd end up going for another surgery and you might end up looking very different to how you expect it to look. Seroma is um, a buildup of fluid underneath the skin. So when the drain comes out, your body's still making fluid and kind of feels like a little bit of a water bottle in your chest. We can manage them quite well. We just need to know about it. You'll probably be at home about two to three weeks later and you kind of feel it. That's when you need to give us a call and say, look, something's not feeling right here. We're feeling right, I'll just have a look. 
Lymphedema, I left in there because I wasn't sure how many people have had breast cancer or maybe going through breast cancer treatment. And that's a side effect of having auxiliary surgery. It's something to keep an eye out for, but you can also get lymphedema off the breast as well. So if you do notice that you're having swelling on the breast, you need to give us a pulse. And then body image issues as well. So body image, I've kind of given its own slide because it's so important, okay? Um, you know, reconstruction is basically as it sounds, but it's not making a new breast, it's making a mound. And it does look very different to what a breast looks like. You know, they do fantastic jobs. I think reconstruction looks amazing, but it looks different to what you have now. So, you know, especially if you're having reconstruction at the same time, you're going to go to sleep with the breast, you're going to wake up with the breast, but it's not going to look the same as the other breast or what you had before. So it's okay to grieve the loss of the breast that you have just, you know, that you've gotten rid of. That can take time and that's not a quick fix, you know? It takes time to get used to feeling how the new feel feels for you. You know, implants can feel very stuck on to begin with and then they settle down. They, they can look a little bit higher on the chest. You need to get used to your new body. And that's not something that's going to happen overnight. That's not going to happen after the drains come out. It's not going to happen when you go home. That can take months and that's okay. It's just knowing, giving yourself a chance to get to grips with what's happening for you. So emotional support is really important. Family, friends, support. Some people don't like talking to their families because it's too close. So the breast care nurses are there for you as well. Marie Keating do amazing work. They've got the peer-to-peer -peer support. Irish Cancer Society, same thing. You can speak to a nurse on the phone. They've also got counseling. And there are formalized counseling services out there. And it's not until you're at home and you're recovering that you actually start to feel and process what you've been through. So it's okay to have good days, it's okay to have bad days, it's okay to have a cry, but it's making sure the good days and the bad days don't start talking to one another. And if that happens, I'm not at home with you, I don't know what's happening, you need to call me and let me know so that I can help you with somebody. So it's just to know that those supports are out there if you need them. And if you need them, it's not a step backwards, it's just you supporting the next bit of your journey. Mental health is also very, very important. Discharge supports when you're going home, Know what numbers you need to contact. If you have a problem, who am I calling? Even if it's just looking up your dog and what's the one in your area, so you know who's about in case you're in um, uh, having an issue. For future appointments, when am I getting my drains out? When am I coming back to see the doctors? When am I doing my dressings? Analgesia, like I said before, baby for pain. Take as many pain as they will give you. Uh, in FBI. Uh, <laughs> in a very, uh, you know, yeah, yeah. moderate treatment and as prescribed. <laughs> as prescribed. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, be aware of the signs of infection. So really important to notice what does an infection look like? If you're looking for redness, you're looking for heat, but compared to the other side as well. You know, if you're having a hot day and you're in a hot room, of course you're going to be warm. Is the breast hot compared to the other side? Is there a new type of pain? So is it burning, stinging? And it's really important, especially with um, implants, you can get an infection up to a year afterwards. So don't just leave it. If you think something's going on, rather know and have a quick five minute conversation to say, actually, that's nothing. Then you're sitting at home worrying about something or an infection brewing for a few days before you think it's bad enough to bother us. Okay? Uh, wound care, like I said, very important. Am I taking my plasters off? Who's taking them off? And when do they come off? Showering, when can I have a shower? Like I said, with the drains, you're normally having to wait, so it's a half shower dependent. So you're kind of doing a bit of a bird wash otherwise. Exercise, doing your exercises at home. Even if you're tired, you still have to do your exercises. Just schedule them in. And if they're a bit sore, take your painkillers a half an hour before you're doing your exercises so that you can do them and make sure you give yourself time to knock back to it. And rest is really important. You're going to use your calories that you normally use to do things to heal. So you need to then account for that. So if getting up, washed, dressed, making breakfast means you're tired, take a nap. If you've got kids that are going to school, make sure that you have a nap before they come home from school so that you're not super tired when they're, they're home as well or that they're not taking it out of you either. If you have a day where you don't rest at all, the next day you're going to feel like you've got a And it's not a step backwards. It's your body just saying, I need to actually just rest now. Mm -hmm. But resting and not resting will impact on your emotions as well. So if you have a day where you don't rest, the next day you're going to feel awful and then you're going to start feeling tearful. And then it's going to kind of impact on your day in, day in afterwards. So getting a really good night's sleep is really important and making sure you rest, okay?
Oh, goodness. Oh. Sorry. Yeah, that's not just in the wrong order. Um, so and just a little bit about getting back to you. The main thing is recovery takes time, okay? It varies for everybody. You know, if you've been through chemotherapy and you've been through other treatments, your recovery is not going to be the same time as somebody who's come in and is having risk-reducing surgery and has walked in off the street with no other treatments behind them. Likewise, somebody who's having risk-reducing surgery it might take a little bit longer than the lady who's had chemo because our bodies are all just very different. The other thing to say is if you're having bilateral surgery, so both sides done, each side will heal in a different time frame. So one might do fantastically, one might have wound healing issues. They, it's all your same body, but they work as completely different entities. You just need to give it a bit of time. Managing your expectations is also really important. You know, the internal stitching, the bruising, the swelling, everything takes time. You're not really going to see a full result maybe three, six months later. It's going to look lumpy, wrinkles. There might be a bit of puckering. It takes, the drains will also impact that So it just takes time. What you see the first day is not how it's going to be long term. I rest because I obviously am a bit of a slob, who knows? Um, I pop that in there again. You need to just look after yourselves. And then open communication with your partners, if you have a partner, or just with yourself, is really important. Getting back to intimacy when you feel ready, if that's in a couple, out of a couple, just with yourself is really important aspect when you feel ready to do it. You know, there are some, the bras that you wear post-surgery are also looking, you'll never wear them again in your life. But there are some sexy bras out there that you can get that have no wires in them. Even just wearing a nice night dress, it might make you feel a little bit more like yourself again. And you know, when you feel ready to show your partner, if you want to show your partner, and when you do that, it's really important to have that communication. Because if you have, you know, they're terrible. You know, they're obviously, you know, they're just as worried as I hurt you, as well as much as you're worried about hurting yourself. So talking to them is really important. Seeing what, you know, how you feel about doing different movements, what hurts, what doesn't hurt, what you can do, when you can do it, um, is really important as well. Um, reconstruction is a process. I'm sure the doctors have gone through that already. You know, it's never just one operation. You know, you are signing yourself up for further surgeries. Whether it's just a nip or a tuck or, you know, a bit of fat grafting or whether it's a nip with reconstruction, it's not just one thing, it, it's a process and it does take time and we'll be in and out of the hospital, maybe not every week and every month, but maybe every year or maybe every second or fourth or maybe fifth year. And then utilize the services are there, you know, the breast care nurses and breast care nurses in every hospital in Dublin. We are busy, you know, you know that you've been in the clinics, you've seen what the clinics are like. But we're happy to take phone calls. Even if you leave a message, we'll call you back when we're ready. No question is too small, especially in the run-up to surgery if you're worried about something, but also after surgery. And it doesn't matter if it's six months later. If you're worried about something, just shout. You know, we direct you to the right person, but also just to go back about the mental health side of things, if you are struggling, let us know. We want to have that chat with you. You won't know how you're going to feel until you're at home. And we're not there seeing you then. We need to know what's going on, okay? Um, Lee, that was great. Thanks so much. And it just shows you that communication is key um, and that there's so much more to address surgery than just the surgery itself. Um, and physiotherapy goes are very important. And next up is, is Kelly Cotton, who's going to talk about the importance of physiotherapy pre and post reconstructive breast surgery. Thank you so much. Um, hello, everyone. Um, uh, as I've been shaped by Lady Kelly Coughlin, um, I'm busy working in St. James's Hospital. Um, I work with Neve, and Neve and I talk to patients day in, day out. I don't know why I find this so much more daunting. <laughs> so bear with me. Um, I just a little bit about myself and what I do and what not what my background is. Um, I worked, I worked throughout the breast cancer um, pathway in St. James's Hospital. I worked in early detection lymphedema um, and I see patients preoperatively before their surgery in clinics with me and with the breast care nurses. Um, I talked to them about what to expect from a physiotherapy point of view after their surgery um, and also I measure them for, uh, for lymphedema and get baseline measurements. I see patients post-op after surgery on the ward 
and and in our physio outpatients for follow up from one month onwards. I'm sorry. Um. So, what is the role of physiotherapy and uh, reconstructive surgery? So I, I'm going to talk a little bit today about what the role of physio is in both breast cancer surgery and re, uh, reconstruction surgery. Um, your physio will guide you on the best way and the correct way of getting in and out of bed. So you've heard a lot about the different types of surgeries that can happen and the different um, consequences of that surgery, what you're allowed and what you're not allowed to do, and that can really vary. So I think having a discussion with your physio about what you're allowed to do and not allowed to do is really important. And getting in and out of bed is quite is one of the first things you'll do, and also one of the things that uses the muscles and the pieces of skin and soft tissue that are used in these surgeries. And um, I'll talk a little bit about that again when I go through the surgeries. And um, your physio will also provide you with exercises for your arms and your stomach and that you can do independently at home, similar to those after your um, mastectomy or your previous surgery. Then help to keep the range of motion of your shoulder and prevent it getting stiff. So one thing about surgery and about pain in general, and even if you have a fracture or any other kind of injury, um, our body's natural response is to guard and look after it. Um, so a lot of patients, we, they come back into us and they're looking after their arm, they're looking after their breast and their chest. Um, but we want you moving it within what you can tolerate, what your body allows you to do. And um, we also give advice regarding exercise and helping to return to your pre-surgery functional levels, um, which is very important. Um, and also, as we mentioned, we help um, from your lungs and from your respiratory point of view in preventing chest infections after surgery. Again, that is down to your pain levels. And when we do have a little bit of pain after surgery, uh, our tendency is not to take deep breaths. And if we're staying in bed, we're not breathing down into the bases of our lungs. So um, we'll talk through that a little bit with you as well. And I'll, I'll discuss that again. Um, so we're very lucky in St. James's Hospital in that we offer a rehabilitation service um, before all cancer surgeries. Um, and just want to talk a little bit about how to prepare for your surgery. So prehabilitation, um, and Nate mentioned it as well, is um, aimed at enhancing your functional and your physiological capacity of an individual to enable them to withstand a stressful event. So the stressful event in this situation is your surgery and it is, it is trauma to your body. Um, so it's important um, before your surgery or your reconstructive surgery, it's important and helpful to improve your fitness levels and your strength um, and the strength of your muscles in order to make yourself as physically fit as possible going into your surgery. And um, that can also vary depending on the surgery you're having. So um, as we've heard about all the different kinds of surgeries, um, for a DF reconstruction, it can be very important to have good core strengthening and spine flexibility prior to your surgery. So just even getting your head around how do you move your core, how do you move your spine and things like that will really, really help with your post-op recovery. For left dorsi or LD and reconstructions, arm strengthening and back strengthening is extremely important prior to your surgery. As well as that, then from an implant um, and a mesh point of view, general strengthening and again, spine flexibility. And just overall, then optimizing your fitness prior to surgery decreases the risk of chest infection and complications. And this will then in turn decrease your hospital length of stay, which is what you want. So then immediately after your surgery, um, you'll be seen by a physio um, on the ward who will talk to you about. The first couple of days can differ surgery to surgery, but the main things initially are taking those deep breaths, clearing your chest if you have any phlegm, getting it out, um, and even just kind of breathing really deeply into your lungs. Circulatory exercises when you're not moving as much as you normally are, and after surgery, opening and closing your hands and pumping your ankles just to keep everything moving nicely. And um, these have also been touched on a little bit already, but things to remember is that your physician will guide you on getting in and out of bed and any other mobility issues you might have. So we did hear an idea earlier who got a frame um, to help get it moving. And sometimes those things can be important just to give you those first couple of steps if needed. Um, a lot of the time they're not. Uh, try not to roll or twist your trunk when you're in bed and when you're moving. And again, a physio will show you the way of getting in and out of bed. Whether you can use your arms, you use your tummy, again, will depend on the type of surgery you've had. 
And Neve also mentioned placing two pillows under your knees to aid comfort when sleeping if your surgeon allows, and no heavy lifting above 2 kg. It's 2 kg is written here, but when I'm talking to patients in the clinic, I talk about um, no heavy lifting, anything heavier than a full kettle is quite a, a kind of easy guide. Um, and what that how that might look for you after is even just setting the kettle for one or two cups instead of a full kettle. Um, or even if you're making a pot of um, your dinner, having two smaller pots instead of one big one. So just adapting the things you do just so that you're not lifting heavy weights that you might lift before but not think twice about. In saying that, your body will tell you when you're doing a little bit too much. Um, and I think the one take home message that I try and get across to patients before their surgery is to listen to your body. So your body will tell you what's too much. Your body will tell you if you have done too much the previous day and you're feeling it the next day. And I think if everyone varies in everyone's recovery and their, their, how they recover after the surgery is so different. And um, so listen to your body is a really, really important message. So um, I'm going to talk individually about uh, the surgeries that I'm most familiar with in James's. Again, they vary um, hospital to hospital and also surgeon to surgeon. So it's important to talk to both your surgeon and your physio about what you're allowed and not allowed to do. And um, these are very, very broad, so I, I hope they make sense. But um, for post-implant and expander surgery, as Ms. Lawler mentioned earlier, um, that's when the implant is there, is placed in underneath the pec muscle and a mesh can be placed to, um, to expand that, that area. Um, this may or may not be expanded over time, but um, the main things that you should avoid after this surgery is putting your arms behind your neck as if you're opening a necklace. Again, that's just going to uh, push and move the implant. Um, and also putting your hand behind your back as if you're trying to open or close a bra. They're just things uh, that would be important to avoid after your surgery to help the mesh to, uh, to take. So any kind of movements involving that pec muscle. Breathing exercises are important and no lifting your arm above shoulder height in that immediate post-op phase. Um, we see patients four weeks post-op back in outpatient clinic and that can vary um, hospital to hospital, but and um, from that week four point, we're really helping you progress your shoulder range of motion, no different to when you've had previous surgery and a breast cancer surgery. So shoulder range of motion, posture control, um, and squeeze, squeezing your shoulder blades together. So all of that kind of scapular retraction work um, is really important. Um, and then just general strengthening and general return <laughs> to physical activity. Then for the latissimus floor side, for the LD flap, um, avoiding anything that the lap dorsi muscle does is really, really important in the first couple of days because um, as you've heard about the surgery itself, the muscle, there's muscle involved in this flap and it's brought from one side to the other and that muscle can still be innervated. So you don't want to use it for the first, the first, um, the first couple of days. So you avoid pushing through your arms and um, pulling your pulling yourself forward or pushing yourself back, anything with that uh, lap dorsi muscle. And um, so that's how we as physios will help you get in and out of bed. And what we want you to do in this situation is use your tummy muscles more rather than using your arms versus in the DF flap. We don't want you to use your tummy, we want you to use your arms. Um, so lifting your arm above shoulder height again and um, restricting those movements for the first, first while. And these all of these time frames can, can vary surgeon to surgery and surgeon to surgeon. Again, when you come back to see us from four weeks onwards, we'll be progressing your shoulder range of motion, your general strengthening. But a big, big thing for, for the LD flaps after your surgery is posture control. So your muscles in your back that um, would have held your shoulder blades back on your back are no longer there. They're moving to the front. So you really need to retrain how to bring your shoulder blades and your shoulders back and um, to get yourself in that good kind of posture. Uh, also general strengthening as well. These are all squeezed in, sorry. Um, so the DF flap then, so again, breathing exercises. So when you do uh, this surgery, as you, as you heard, um, it's a big surgery and there is a lot of recovery with it. But I suppose from a rehab point of view, there is a lot less rehab down the line, really because you no know, muscle is involved. And um, it's that soft tissue. You will have a big incision across your tummy and you will have drains as Neve has just discussed. 
but you will need to get up and get moving with these strains and with this incision. Okay, so um, physio again will come into you after a surgery, get you up, get you moving within what you can tolerate. And with this, we want you to kind of avoid using your abdominals to get in and out of bed. So we kind of get you to, to use your arms a little bit more or get a little bit of help getting in and out of bed from the front. From day five, you'll start some really gentle pelvic rolls, nothing too strenuous, but just moving your pelvis and just getting used to how that moving in your how that should move and how your abdominals move. So really gentle pelvic rolls and knee rolls from side to side. Then when you come back to us from the four week mark, we'll, sorry, work on that scapular spot shoulder blades, bringing them back, posture control again. But a big thing, as you can imagine, for the DX laps is core strengthening. So we work a lot then on your Pilates type exercises. So we'd start your strengthening, such as your bridging, your Superman, and all those all those exercises that you might be familiar with already. Um, okay, so then other things to consider after your reconstruction. Um, I think the most important thing to, to think about is think gradual. So don't, what you were able to do before your surgery, you will not be able to do after your surgery. So just uh, start really, really low, whether it's walking, start five minutes down the road and then see how you are the next day. And you'll know whether you're able to do more the day after that. If you're not, that's fine, but you'll just know you need to listen to your body. No lifting, like I've said, no heavy lifting for the first six weeks, so you're allowed to get anyone else at home to do the heavy lifting for you. Um, resume gradual weight lifting from then, so start really, really light. I start all of my patients on a 1kg when they come back into my clinic, um, and I just, they're surprised at how heavy that can actually feel to them. So I get them to start with that and then gradually work their way up. Scar massage then, so um, if they're having any difficulty with scars, sometimes if there has been some auxiliary surgery, that scar can be a little bit um, a little bit tight and a little bit tough. And um, so massaging that out um, can help with a kind of a water-based cream, like E45 or face cream. Um, I haven't mentioned it here, but I will mention, I know it's not specific to reconstruction surgery, but if you are having any auxiliary surgery, you could have some cording or some um, auxiliary web syndrome, it might be called as well. And that's when you have um, cords that go across under your arm and you can massage them out and we can help you with that. And that can limit your range of motion after your surgery and just stop you from getting that last little bit of movement. Physical activity is another key element of your rehabilitation following breast surgery. So gradually getting back to exercise is really, really important. And I know me have touched on it as well, but um, you want to be as physically fit as possible going into your surgery to make things easier coming out of your surgery and getting back to that level of, of fitness. Um, I'm going to talk about the benefits of exercising, which a lot of you I'm sure already know, but um, the benefits of exercising throughout your cancer journey and beyond, um, it helps with cancer-related fatigue. So that can be a big issue. And it's probably one of the things that I, I feel patients struggle with the most when they come back into me is that they're just extremely, extremely tired and they don't know why. And your body is healing and your part of your healing and your energy is going into that. So exercising can help with your fatigue. It improves your sleep and improves your energy levels. It can also help improve your quality of life, reduce anxiety and depression, and just getting out, getting moving can help whether it's a walk down the road for five minutes with someone. Bone health, um, it helps reduce the risk of fractures, maintains strength and prevents weakness. It help, also helps reduce the side effects of treatment uh, and reduces the amount of treatments missed due to illness. Um, so I've just touched on these um, guidelines for physical activity and cancer. Um, so we, we use the uh, guidelines from the American College of Sports Medicine, um, and we would, we would talk to our patients about aiming towards this. So what that looks like is 150 minutes of moderate intensity, intensity exercise per week. And what moderate intensity exercise is, is a brisk walk or a cycle, um, or else 75 minutes of vigorous intensity exercise, um, such as running each week. If that's not what you're able to do, that's okay. Some physical activity is better than none. And the main thing is just to avoid inactivity. Um, as well as that, then strength training to, to three times per week and stretching on days that other exercises are performed. 
So what are my take home messages? Um, ask your physiotherapist what you're allowed and not allowed to, um, as well as your surgeon. As, as we've heard, there's lots of differences in the, in the types of surgeries and what, it depends on what part of your body is affected. So just be sure and be clear on what you're allowed and not allowed to. Movement is medicine, so get up and get moving as soon as you can after your surgery and you will feel the benefits in the long run. Uh, avoid heavy lifting, so offload all of those jobs and think gradual. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Kelly. It <clears throat> seems that the, the physiotherapy really gets the patient involved with the recovery, which is really good. So, Eva's been invited to patients. And so this will be our last group of patient presenters. Um, so I'll call to the stage Iris Wolf, and Mary McCabe, Maria Karen, and Josephine. Well, um, can I ask that the first four ladies who are in the show and tell can make their way across in about 10 minutes' time? So that's Louise Byrne, Tina Dawson, Mary Colleen, and Therese McGrail. There'll be some medical students just outside the room to show you where the show and tell will be. Okay, and can I get a round of applause, please, for us? Thank um, so much for her um, coming here today. Um, this afternoon, I know that she's, she's very busy and um, she's been actively involved in Friday over the last couple of years. And uh, she liked her work. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak here today. Um, it's the talks that I've seen so far have been just so inspiring and really reminds us all why we do this. Um, and why we love our job. Um, my name is Shreem Walsh. I'm one of the breast cancer surgeons in the matter, uh, matter public and matter private. And I also work for Breast Check. Um, and I do oncoplastic surgery specifically. And just to give you an idea of the crazy volumes that we're seeing at the moment, we obviously had a little dip in breast cancer diagnosis in 2020, which is the peak of the pandemic. Part of that was because the breeding stopped for a number of months. Um, and in 2021, we recovered our numbers again. And then when I checked our numbers this week, although I don't have them on the slide, in both breast check and breast health, we've, by the end of August, we met 2021's numbers. So a lot of that, some of that is delayed diagnosis, it's getting um, screening back up and running. So we're incredibly busy at the moment. Um, but I'm very lucky to work as part of a huge multidisciplinary team. We now have five breast cancer surgeons in the matter. We work closely with our plastic surgery colleagues. We've got a fantastic radiation oncology, medical oncology team. Um, and we have a fantastic nursing staff as well, some of whom are here today. Um, and we also work closely with radiology and pathology. So it's an absolutely massive team and we work very closely together. So my talk is switching gears a little bit. We're getting a little bit away from the reconstruction element and it's more of a sort of interest lecture. So I've, I've just been tasked with um, giving some latest updates in breast cancer surgery. And apart from, it's really one of the things that makes me love being a breast cancer surgeon. Um, apart from having the opportunity to treat such inspiring women every day, but also the fact that so much research is going on all the time because it's such a common cancer. And so our plan and our management and our treatment and the surgery changes all the time. And even in the 15 years that I've been involved in breast surgery, there has been such a change in how we manage things. And so I just wanted to give a little snapshot of that. And I hope to give people hope that we are constantly researching and changing and endeavoring to improve the experience and the outcomes of women with breast cancer and with genetic mutations. So I just kind of tried to limit it down to the four most recent changes in breast cancer surgery. And one of the things that has changed dramatically since I qualified has been management of the armpit or the axilla. So the armpit is really important in breast cancer because it is the first place that a breast cancer would generally spread to. And so we carefully ass assess and carefully treat the axilla in cases of breast cancer. That starts with a thorough physical examination, followed by an ultrasound and sometimes MRI and CAT scans. Um, any, bio, any abnormal nodes are generally biopsied. And then if this is all normal, the general procedure of choice is a fentanyl lymph node biopsy. So there's generally two procedures surgically for treating the axilla and also for staging the axilla because it really has two um, goals here. One is seeing how bad the disease is because we look at the volume or how many nodes are affected and how big the cancer is in the axilla and that tells us 
how likely a recurrence is in the future or how much systemic treatment or radiation somebody's going to need to keep that disease under control. And also there's a therapeutic aspect because removing cancer that's there is important to achieve a cancer-free state. So the traditional um, procedure was really going into the armpit and taking all of the auxiliary lymph nodes out of three zones, level one, two, and three. And these are just anatomical areas that are in relation to the pec minor muscle, which is under your big, your pec major muscle. When I was training, we would always go all the way up to level three, but nowadays we sort of reserve that for bad cases or more severe cases. Um, and we try and limit the dissection um, as much as possible. And I'll, I'll explain why in a minute. What is overtaken from this procedure in recent years is a central lymph node biopsy. This came about over 20 years ago. And what is done is a dye, either radioactive or blue dye, is injected into the breast, and whichever nodes take up that dye are removed. And studies of thousands of women have shown that this, if those nodes are free of disease, it's most likely like over 90% sure that the rest of the axilla has no disease. And so that procedure spared so many women in, you know, after this procedure came to the forefront of having an auxiliary clearance. So why do we ever do an auxiliary clearance? It's to clear cancer and also to see how many nodes are positive. And so who should have all of the lymph nodes taken? And that's the big question. And that's what's really changed in recent years. And the other question is, well, why not just remove all of the lymph nodes in every woman with breast cancer? And the problem is that it is a very morbid procedure. As some of you will know, the rate of getting a chronic swelling of the arm, which we call lymphedema, is up to 25% when we take all of the lymph nodes. There also can be some um, problems with shoulder movement that can be due just to scar tissue or, to damage, or due to damage to some of the big nerves that run through the area. And also, you may never regain um, some of the sensation to the upper inner arm. Um, and that's really unavoidable, especially if there's a lot of disease in the axilla. So traditionally, everybody got that procedure to clear all of the lymph nodes. But there's been a massive drive in breast cancer research in recent years to really sub-select out women who absolutely need it, and even to try and reduce the number of women who benefit from it. Because it, it is the leading cause of morbidity and survivorship. I'm not sure if any of you have seen Kathy Bates talk about this. I was at a conference in America a while ago, and she is one of the big spokespeople for lymphedema in America. She has what she's a carrier of one of the BRCA mutations. Um, and she actually did develop cancer and has massive lymphedema in both her arms. And she goes around talking about it at breast cancer conferences. Um, so how do we try and avoid auxiliary clearance? Well, first of all, we've, we've so many studies that have now shown us that with tiny amounts of disease, like isolated tumor cells or little deposits that are under two millimeters, actually there's no benefit from auxiliary clearance. But it then got researchers thinking, what about women who have greater than two millimeters but it's only in maybe one or two nodes. So we have a landmark paper that changed the landscape for these women. They, it was a phase three clinical trial where they took almost a thousand women who were having breast conserving surgery, that's a lumpectomy. And in their sentinel nodes, only one or two were positive with greater, with greater than two millimeters of disease. And traditionally, up until about 2010, all of those women got a clearance. And so in this study, they randomized those almost a thousand women to either have the surgery or not. And what did they find? There was no difference at 10 years. And um, the one difference that there was was that less women had lymphedema in the group that did not have an auxiliary clearance. So in the last 10 years, we've seen a massive reduction in the amount of women that we have to do that major surgery, in, which is fantastic. But, but then it got everyone thinking, well, what about women with a small amount of disease in their lymph nodes at the time they're diagnosed? Do we really need to be removing all of their lymph nodes all of the time? And so one of the things, and I'm going to talk about it in a different way in a minute, another thing that was coming to the forefront around the same time was giving systemic therapy, that's chemo or targeted therapies or even endocrine therapy before operating to see if that could really pull back on the extent of surgery we needed to do. And so people got thinking, could we do that for women who have disease in their lymph nodes? Um, and part of what really gave us the confidence to run the trials was that it was noted that in women who had um, no disease at the outset, 
who got chemotherapy or targeted therapy, like for her two positive disease before their surgery. When they were brought to surgery, their axillas were fully cleared. There was no cancer left in the armpit in around a third of them across the board. But the problem was people were worried about, will the dye still, you know, the dye that we give to find the sentinel node, is that going to travel the same way along lymphatics that actually had cancer in them? And then we're treated with chemo. Can we trust the procedure? So reliability was the big question. So what they did was run four big trials, and I won't bog you down with too many figures or statistics, but in these trials, most of the women, they allowed them to have sentinel lymph node biopsy, but then cleared their axilla in the same surgery. So then they could see, well, in the women who had negative sentinel node, how many of them actually had positive nodes that weren't picked up, that weren't identified by the dye? And so, so when they looked at the figures initially, the false negative rate, which means a negative sentinel node, but actually disease left in the axilla, was a little bit high. But they realized that if we took certain precautions in this population, then actually it could, we could achieve a false negative rate of less than 10%. And some of those technical considerations are making sure you take more nodes than usual, maybe sometimes using two dyes, and carefully examining the armpit with the imaging, like an MRI, and physically, before you decide that a sentinel lymph node is suitable. And so now this is something that we do. We actually had a little retrospective look at women who got neoadjuvant chemotherapy who had positive lymph nodes at the outset in the matter. And we found that actually across the board, um, over 50% had no disease in their axilla after getting neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Now, if you did get into the nitty gritty of this, you could see that we do sub-select out for this. We did sub-select out for this study people who had a small volume of disease, like maybe one or two positive nodes where the nodes were mobile. And also we know that people with women with HER2 positive disease or triple negative disease are more likely to achieve that negative lymph node after the therapy. But it's given us a lot of confidence with what we do. And so management of the axilla really has a new, um, we have a new perspective now in recent years. You know, axillary clearance we know is a leading cause of morbidity. More aggressive surgery doesn't necessarily improve outcomes. For clinically node negative, sentinel lymph node biopsy is the procedure of choice, and not everyone with a positive node needs that auxiliary clearance. And for clinically node positive disease, we have a good think about giving systemic therapy beforehand to see if we can pull back on the amount of surgery that's needed at the end. However, again, a caveat is inflammatory breast cancer that always needs an auxiliary clearance. It is a different type of breast cancer. So in the future, with auxiliary management, I think earlier detection hopefully is going to lead to less auxiliary disease. Although anecdotally, after COVID, we have we have seen a lot more nodal disease, probably because of late presentations and stuff in screening. But I'm hoping that totally reverses in the next year or two. New, newer neoadjuvant therapies will hopefully lead to less women needing auxiliary terms. And the goal really for anyone who's doing research or anyone who's doing breast surgery is to just make lymphedema a thing of the past. So giving the imaginary therapy also, um, it, it's giving, you can give target therapies, um, and there's a lot of them now, both on and off trials, chemotherapy, and even endocrine therapies like tamoxifen or aromatase inhibitors before surgery. Um, and it's been proven in multiple trials that even when it doesn't work well, it's safe. It, we rarely see a progression while on those treatments. And we're generally giving them, giving this at the moment, this new treatment plan, to women with advanced disease, HER2 positive, triple negative cancers, and no positive disease. And one question we often get asked is, you know, well, should we not just get rid of the cancer straight away with surgery? But it's not always the best idea. So in the past, we were giving the treatment beforehand to convert an inoperable cancer to operable cancer. But now we're doing it when we see someone who maybe, if we operated today, we need to do a mastectomy. But if we give this first, maybe we can get away with just a lumpectomy. And as I just explained, in order to maybe spare someone's auxiliary nodes, which are important in terms of lymphedema, infection, um, and it also gives us a unique insight into the biology of the tumour. So recently, we've had a couple of more trials that have shown for certain types of cancer, if we give the, the standard therapy before operating, and then we remove the tumour. If we see that that tumour hasn't really responded, maybe we give a different treatment afterwards. 
Whereas we don't know that if it's given after the tumor has been removed. So the other trials have shown that then giving those different treatments afterwards can increase and improve survival and make recurrence less likely in the future. But um, as I, I know Arnie Hill was mentioned earlier, as he often says, I mean, one of the big goals of all these treatments is to make breast surgeons obsolete. You know, maybe, you know, maybe people won't need surgery in a couple of years, and that would be fantastic. So then just a little note, um, I, I'm conscious that it's the end of the day, so I'll go as quickly as I can. What's new in, in breast conserving surgery? Because I know the focus of today has really been on um, mastectomy and what's new in breast reconstruction in that context. But I think we're going to see, we are seeing and we will see a big rise on plastic breast surgery. Um, and I sometimes call this the silver lining of lumpectomy, where we are now employing techniques where we can operate and do a lumpectomy on women whose tumor size would have traditionally meant that they needed a mastectomy. And we do this by moving around tissue, moving the nipple, and sometimes even, as you can see on the bottom, and I do this myself sometimes, doing a standard breast um, reduction surgery, but incorporating a tumor into that. Um, and this has been shown to have no impact on recurrence rates, and there's lots of studies showing that. Um, but I think it is an exciting uh, new, new thing in breast surgery. Um, and then the other um, big advancement we've seen um, in recent years, and this is only in the last three years, is techniques in breast localization. So some of you who have started out with having lung hectomy for a cancer or a breast lesion that, that couldn't be felt or was not palpable may have needed this to be localized for the surgeon on the day of the surgery. And all of these years, what that involved was having a wire put into that tumor or lesion on the day of surgery. And it had so many problems, it was uncomfortable. Women would often need a little bit of sedation and then have to be brought to the, other, to the operating theater in a wheelchair. The wire could fall out, there was a big bandage involved. And because this is a long structure, it wasn't always very accurate. And if it pulled slightly, then maybe it's not the center of the lesion anymore. So we have brought in a new technique um, and we brought it in in the matter about three years ago. It's called a mag seed. And instead of using a wire, this is a tiny little magnetic steel seed that's the size of a grain of rice that can be put in at any time before the surgery. So we were having people get it inserted on the day of their COVID swab. Um, and it's very safe. And then we use a little handheld MRI machine to find it. And it has allowed us to take smaller volumes. Um, so, you know, we're not kind of guessing where is this along the wire. We're taking something that's around this tiny seam so we can be really accurate in what we remove. Um, and we, our reports from patients is that the experience has been fantastic. And especially in women who've had a wire guided procedure in the past and then have come back and needed a magnetic seed guided procedure, they've said that the experience has been totally different. We published our first 100 seeds that we did in the matter. Um, but actually, we, we presented a grand rounds this morning, and so we pulled all of our numbers, and we've done, actually, that figure is wrong, we've done over 1,600 mag seed cases in the matter now, um, and that's only in the public hospital, so we've done a couple of hundred more in the private, so we're feeling very confident with it, and the feedback's been fantastic. So just one little note at the end, uh, what do I see as the future of breast surgery? What are the goals? And I think it's really tailoring, and I think this probably was one of the themes of the day, really tailoring surgical treatment, not just to the cancer, but to the patient and to the woman. And I would often say to patients, you know, I think it's good for us to get to know each other a little bit so I can understand what your goals are. And then I can explain what my goals are and that we can really make a plan that's right for you. Um, and I think minimizing surgery, especially in the armpit, is going to be a huge goal for the future. And because survival rates are getting better and better every year, and I would hope in the future it'll be 100%. Quality of life is the new focus, um, and making sure that you're happy and feeling fully functional in the whole rest of your life once you're over the breast cancer. And then just improving the patient experience as they go through their breast cancer during the hospital and through the treatment oh, and yeah. surgery. I think those are our goals, really. So thank you for listening, and thank you for inviting me. So I think the look before questions asked, you know, it was very extensive, and so like I think that's been a theme the whole day is communication is really important, education is really important, and then like it was a best professor Stokes did a talk as well, is that with more and more advances and the finance less for probably so great. Thanks, many. So just to open the floor for questions answers. 
the show and tell is also starting now. So if anybody wants to go to that um, before asking any questions, then you can go outside and there's some medical students who will show you the way over to it. Um, and also for questions as well. Good question. So if people want to start making their way across, yeah, some of our ladies who review the show as well. So like, put some really, oh yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, they, they need to go soon. Hello, thanks to everybody. And um, I'm just wondering if any of the experts are familiar with the resensation. And um, I don't think we've spoken about it much today, but I hear, I hope I'm not wrong, that in the States, and um, there's some surgery that you can have after a couple of years after reconstruction where they can resensitize nerves. Because the older ladies were speaking about the lack of feeling that you have after. There are, there are a few advances, but it's usually at the time of surgery where you can take a small nerve and you can re attach it to one of the nerves that come out, from one of the ribs. So you can get sensation in your, in your feet as you start to your DM. Um, so that's that's a, that's it's a new technical sort of refinement that uh, has a sort of, it's, I think it's a new So I, I looked into this. So the, the issue is. Most of your breast sensation comes through the breast. So the fact of by doing a full oncological clearance or a full cancer operation, you lose most of the sensation. But there are some sensory nerves that you can connect to, say, a DF flap. And so the big thing is going through the neurotization of a DF flap so that your tummy flap taking the abdomen is connected by blood vessels, but also connecting nerve. But they connect the DF um, nerves that come in from the side and go to the skin. that we like to kind of try to connect the armpit or under the ribs. There's a big gap. You don't have enough nerve. But what they have in America is cadaveric nerve, as in uh, a patient who's passed away, they harvest skin and things that are used on other people, and you use cadaveric skin for other plastic surgery operations. But cadaveric nerve is used for trauma and things like that. And so they can use like a 10 centimeter bit of cadaveric nerve to bridge the gap between your DF and your chest. In Europe, it's not approved and it's not okay. And so to, if I was to neurotize DF on you, I would have to harvest the nerve from your lower leg, that would be your sural nerve, and give you a numb spot on your foot. And every nerve in your body has a function, so I can't take a nerve with no downside. And then the outcomes from neurotized DFs are not concrete. They're not like a definite sensory recovery. So I'm not going to start stealing a nerve from your leg um, in the hope that it's going to innervate part of your dead flap, not your breast skin. The breast skin is... It, it, that, that's still a lottery whether you'll get sensation still in your breast skin. Some people have it, some people don't. But to innervate a DM flap, currently in the EU, you would have to take a nerve from somewhere else in your body. That's the big issue. I think I would echo what Richard and Jenny have said. There are groups, particularly I think in Holland and Belgium, that are trying some of the sensation procedures. But re innervation or regrowth of the nerve, when it's been damaged or cut, is an extremely slow process. And <laughs> At present, I don't think it's something that's particularly successful. I think it's something that went to as well from the Netherlands, where they're sort of trying nerve sparing mastectomy, but there's no long term oncological outcomes. And I would think that probably to leave your behind, you're probably leaving the breast tissue behind. And that would be the that would be the opinion in general of the breast cancer surgery community. But we'll we'll watch for new developments and um hope you that we'll see long term data. That was that the plastic surgeons. Where do you stand on smokers reconstruction? It's much to ask about smokers and reconstruction. The textbook answer for the, the, the junior doctors of trainees is you don't offer free tissue transfer to a smoker. But the practical answer, you should stop for a four to six weeks. Yeah, I, I was going to say it's a hard line very much for me for its late reconstruction because that's a complication in risk profile that you can change. And so you shouldn't have your surgery until you're optimized, and that's optimization. If you're an immediate breast cancer patient, I'm much more softer and I'll ask you to stop for as long as you can. But realistically, if you're going through breast cancer, you've got all these things, it's extreme stress and time. But I'll have a pretty upfront conversation and say you're almost 100% going to have some sort of weak complication. I'll help you get through it and I'll help you get through it, but you will have a more protracted, you know, recovery. Your DF fat won't fail because of smoking, but your tummy might open and all your scars might be worse. And so smoking got anything in that. So essentially, if you have time to change and modify a risk factor, you should change. If you don't have time, I mean, you need to kind of have a discussion. Thank you.
But the controls have a negative effect in that step. So now that it's very strong, it's a very long capacity. Best interest. You know, I think there are studies out there which show that you get the best settlement from stopping four weeks before the office after surgery. And then you're smoking close to the last surgery. I know you serve risks in terms of basis passing with the doctor's contract, restricting. It's also risks in terms of the GMA results. You've probably seen the same in the skin plus after obstetrics. Yeah, I, I would actually um, say I, I, I'm glad to know that somebody should never smoke again after they've had their recon. I recently did an implant reconstruction surgery on somebody and she, she did fantastically. She quit three weeks before the surgery. She healed beautifully. 12 weeks post-op, she was back on cigarettes. And literally about a week later, got a red breast and the wound opened. So I, it, it, I'm shocked that it would happen that far out. Yes. But she was absolutely perfect at 12 week mark. So I think we can't underestimate the um, effect that smoking has on, on these skin flaps that are essentially sitting on the pattern implant. Mm -hmm. If there are no more questions, sorry, go ahead, ask your question. Uh, someone who had uh, breast reconstruction 10 years ago with uh, implant reconstruction, with one of these implants, which can potentially give rise to ALCL, what would you think of, you know, the removal of those implants, please? Only if there's a problem. So if there's a notable change in size or shape, a swelling, acute swelling, pain, or only if there's a change, we don't, we don't necessarily have the recommendations not to go and expand anything unnecessarily. Uh, the other part of that is like you know, the the patient in decision making. The patient is very anxious. They've had a breast cancer in the past, and they really, really want to have it. Like a confidence that they're not going down. But the incidence is very, very low. And the student will tell you that the incidence of occurrence of breast cancer is much more higher than the incidence of uh, ALCL. So I think it's probably um, so the, the individual decision. Yeah. I think there are a few conferences on ALCL which have happened recently in the past number of months. And the general recommendations that I give to patients is that removal of the implant, conversion to smooth implant, would not affect your life targets of ALCL. So the risk is established once you have that initial texture difference in place. So removing it doesn't change your, your future risk. It's such a rare, it's such a rare cancer that even the whole texture thing is skewed because everyone is using texture yeah, implants. It's, 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 right in you know in that patient cohort. Sort of. I would say the instance is so like around one in three thousand five hundred. I think it's only been two yeah. or three cases I mean, in Ireland. I, I, it's, I it's, it's a teen cell mediated cancer, it's just an inflammatory uh, mediated cancer. So I think that you said textured is we were using textured implants, so therefore cases happen in those. I'm sure in the future smooth implants will happen in cases as well. It's just a matter of time out if we're all using it. Hey folks, I think it's been a very, very long day. I think it's been amazing the amount of information we have learned from all of our experts. Um, I want to thank everybody. It's been wonderful to have so many preeminent surgeons, healthcare professionals, uh, for anybody who's affected by breast cancer who has, has to contemplate risk-reducing surgery going forward. I think the word empowerment is definitely one that springs to mind. I think we've all been equipped with so much information and so much knowledge that will enable us and empower us to really make the right decisions and to plan that procedure. And I think learning from the ladies who were so privileged to hear and how every story was unique. And I think one of the ladies said, you know, every journey is different. Every you know, make your own decisions. You're the one in power. Um, so from us from the Reiki Foundation, I just want to thank Bernie, Jane, Helen, Linda, Fiona, Lisa, and everybody at the foundation who worked behind the scenes uh, to make today happen. I want to thank Richard, um, Robert, Eva, uh, and the team at the Matter. Uh, I think it was a wonderful partnership. We've grown this event over the last number of years and we look forward to Broadway next year again.
I'd also like to thank all of our speakers, amazing um, amount of information that we learned today. Uh, it really was fantastic and we have, we have recorded the session, we will make the, the recording available on our website for anybody else who was not able to make today or who would like to go back and listen to so much information to take in, so for anybody who might like to revisit that. But last but not least, I just really want to thank all of you uh, for coming today, for empowering yourselves, for informing yourselves. And um, we look forward to working with you and do come along to the Reheating Foundation. We have lots of information, resources available for you. We're with you at every step. So thank you again. I just to say that the show and tell ladies are in room three. So if anybody would like to go and talk to uh, any of our wonderful ladies and very much um, who have, have volunteered to tell their stories on a one-to-one -one basis and I think that, that's so powerful as well, just to hear exactly what their individual stories um, have been. So thank you so much. I could thank everybody again. But I mean, you all know your ego is fantastic, um, world is fantastic, all the speakers, especially all the ladies that took the time out to come. Um, it is all about your, your breast cancer, and it's all about your experience and your education. So thanks very much. See you all next year. Thanks very much for all the sponsors, especially Pfizer. And thanks very much for the Marie Teaching Foundation. You're looking like fantastic. So see you all next year. Third way on the other program. Thank you.